Hi again then guys and welcome to another installment of the Beards and Cars podcast which you can incidentally grab in its audio only form on SoundCloud via the link below and this is a community suggested topic once again and one which I have an immediate interest in when I saw it. I found it intriguing, it's a great discussion to have and I love having these kind of discussions with you guys especially down in the comments Because, yes, it's fun to talk about cars, it's fun to talk about racing, but when you can actually take that even further and begin to maybe learn something about yourself, something about your psyche or your emotions or why you think something, I think that can be only beneficial. And in a similar way to how Gran Turismo, for instance, can help to teach you geography in a weird kind of way, sometimes discussions about things which don't seem that important can help you to learn things about yourself that you might not have known. And I genuinely believe that this topic could be one of those. And as you saw from the title and the thumbnail, that topic is why do some cars, quote unquote, fail? Why are some vehicles even, beyond just the world of cars, you could say, failures? Well, first of all, of course, you have to define a failure. Most people, when they think of a car being a failure, would probably think of sales numbers. That's certainly what a company themselves would refer to a failure as, something like a Ford Edsel or a Plymouth Prowler, perhaps the Pontiac Aztec. And the commonality between many of these is that they tend to be not conventionally pretty, let's say, cars which the public didn't like that much. And yet here is the interesting thing, because even though the manufacturers would probably deem them failures, and even though many people would use them as the butt of a joke, isn't it interesting how many of those become cult classics, with entire communities based around their mutual love for them? So a car can be a failure, and yet a large group of people will end up loving it for that. It's almost like an exaggerated form of the underdog mentality, which many of us, of course, are familiar with, and many of us do root for the underdogs, going up against the big corporation in Ford v Ferrari, for instance, or some privateer team headed up against a bigger team at Le Mans or in some event or in Formula One or whatever the case may be. Juggernaut versus underdog is always a classic story, especially when it happens in real life. And yet, traditional human mentalities and the whole survival of the fittest kind of thing would make you believe that you should distance yourself from anything that is remotely a failure, because by definition they are not the fittest in that given scenario. So that, I believe, is the interesting part of the discussion. Why do we love cars, vehicles, people even, that society may deem a failure? Not just for sales in the sake of a car, but even a vehicle that is created for a certain purpose that then fails to achieve that purpose. Not necessarily a sales number, it could be a certain speed that the car is aiming for. It might be the idea of winning a certain event or a certain racing series that it simply doesn't do. And yet, there's an interesting phenomena that happens. And it almost ties into what I mentioned earlier about cars such as the Pontiac Aztec, because I'll give you an example and see what you think. See how this example makes you feel. I will tell you about a car that was created back in the 1960s. It raced in the 1970s. It was designed to win, of course, as any race car is, a particular racing series. Yet, the car was so unreliable that not only did it almost careen straight off the track a number of times and hurt the driver, but it also raised safety concerns for other drivers on the track as well, and ultimately the car not only did not win a single race, but it was banned. That car, by pretty much anyone's definition, could be called a legitimate, total failure. I'm referring to the Chaparral 2J. That is a failure. And yet look how many of us love it. Why do we love it? Well, that to me is the fascinating part, because I would posture that the reason why we love a car that may even be a failure is the same reason why we love an underdog. And I would argue that the reason why we love an underdog is because of more than just accolades. It's more than peer reviews. It's more than positive social image about whatever or whoever it is in question. It's because humans have an innate love most of us, at least, who are you know, socially functioning in a quote-unquote normal way, have a natural inclination towards supporting someone or something that has their heart in the right place, as we would often say. Something that has character, something that can be rooted for even if they don't succeed. 
Look how many movies are entirely about that. Sports movies are almost entirely about that. And even consider two movies from this year. My two favourite movies of the year, in fact. Joker and Ford v Ferrari. Both are about an underdog in their respective scenario who we want to succeed. And here's the interesting thing. One is a villain, and yet you still want them to succeed. Because character and that heart and the feeling of something not being fair is a very powerful motivator for humans. And I find that to be a very fascinating part of this discussion because being a failure in the car world almost is irrelevant. And consider this channel as another example. The entire Unsung Heroes series, which so many of you love and some people have even said is their favourite thing I do, is entirely based on cars that failed. <laughs> very few of them actually achieved what they set out to do. Even less of them would win any kind of beauty contest. And speaking to that, it is interesting to me how many cars that are considered failures do tend to be because of their visual appearance. And that is somewhat ironic, because it's kind of meaningful and shallow at the same time. Because there are people who say that they're a failure because they are traditionally ugly. Pontiac Aztec, Plymouth Prowler, whatever. And yet at the same time, the moral part of us that supports the underdog loves them for it. It's almost like a self-contradiction. And it happens even with humans too. Society, generally speaking, tends to reject people who are different. I've experienced this myself, and I learned to just live with it. I don't try to make people like me anymore. I couldn't care less. <laughs> I don't even try. I am who I am. If you like that, great. If you don't, get lost, to put it lightly. Other people are a slave to it. I've grown up with people who are a slave to it, who had to feel loved, and they would do anything, even humiliate themselves, to get that love from their peers. And I think that that's a shame. It really is sad to watch, but I understand how some people crave that so much that they have to do it. Even somebody who has, for instance, a, a disability of some kind, could be physical, could be mental, whatever the case may be, society will often push them away, and yet, so many of us love to root for those people. Take, for example, an African-American model by the name of Winnie Harlow. She has a skin condition, something which society would classify technically as a flaw, a failure, if you will. She's not normal, conventionally speaking. And yet, I must admit, and I'm sure this will offend some people, I find her ten times more attractive and more memorable than if she didn't have that skin condition. And I'm not the only one, because so does Lewis Hamilton, apparently. They went out together for a while. So it is interesting how sometimes, for instance in a school, kids will really push anything different out of the club. And I'm sure that many of you guys will remember maybe that happening to you, maybe you were one of the people who did it to someone else back in school. And yet, when you reach adulthood, Hopefully, a lot of people end up having massive communities of fandom, such as Winnie Harlow, because of what they used to probably be bullied for. It's very interesting how it goes way beyond just cars. Something which is a, a failure, if you will, in whatever sense, ends up getting this strong, hyper-focused fanbase, which love them almost because of the failure. And I personally find that fascinating. And of course, we need to discuss it primarily in regard to cars, because that's the point of the channel. But I do find it interesting how the same kind of mentality goes way beyond just cars. Because it's not about cars, it's more about humanity, and the way we think about anything, and it just happens to apply to cars as well. But if I had to, for instance, call out a vehicle or vehicles that I could think about which I would classify as failures, well, as I already said, the majority of cars in Unsung Heroes failed at what they were trying to do, and yet I still love those. In modern times, I would probably think of maybe a couple of cars in particular, which I would classify as probably a failure. The Chaparral 2J is a perfect example back in the 70s. But today, you could make an argument for, for instance, the Nissan GTR LM Nismo, the front-wheel drive LMP car being a failure, because it was designed to win an event using alternative technology and an alternative approach, and it simply wasn't good enough. Now that, I think, is a crucial difference to what Toyota did in the late 90s with the GT1. They were leading the race, and then because of that, of course, well-known tyre blowout now, they didn't win. I would not call that a failure, though. And although some people would probably disagree, to me, I would only call a car a failure regardless of if that's a damning thing for the car or not, 
I would only call it a failure if it actually did compete to the best of its ability and still wasn't good enough. To me, the Toyota didn't fail because it wasn't good enough. It failed because of an, un an unforeseen thing that can happen to any car. So I would say that that is a sad occasion, but it's not a failure. Much like if you, for instance, say you're still in school, you try and do a test, you give it your all, and you make a stupid mistake from not reading a question properly. That's not a failure, as far as I'm concerned. You didn't fail because you didn't know it, or because you didn't study hard enough. You just made a simple mistake. That is so much different to a failure. And I think that the vast majority of times that people use the term failure about people, about things, about whatever, it tends to either be completely wrong as a label, almost like how people throw the word ironic around all over the place and nine times out of ten it's not ironic at all, but also it's something which it's almost lost its value to some degree because the word is used so much. So ultimately, my hypothesis, my theorem, <laughs> if you will, regarding cars specifically, because let's not apply this fully to people, as far as cars go, I would say that similar to what many movie reviewers have said, actually, such as I believe Chris Stuckman being one and some other people as well, the greatest sin that a movie can commit is being boring. I would actually say that that kind of applies to a car as well. A car that is a true failure is not something that didn't achieve what it set out to do. It's not something that didn't sell well enough. It's not something that wasn't even fast enough, even though you could use that as a marker, as I said earlier with the Nissan. I would say that the ultimate definition, the purest definition by my rationale at least, which of course could still be wrong by somebody else's, is a car that is so mediocre at everything, with so little effort put into it in any way, and no true passion behind it, that it becomes forgotten. Something that's not even so bad it's good, it's just meh. It's grey. It's nothing. To me, that is a failure. And the funny thing about that is, cars like that don't even tend to be remembered. So I can't really think of any cars like that, because that's kind of the point. But I could just be blowing smoke up my own ass here, so <laughs> who knows? Tell me your thoughts down below. I do find it a very interesting discussion. I'd love to hear your thoughts not just on the car side, but maybe on the human side as well. And of course you could apply the same rationale to pretty much any vehicle of any kind. Certainly cars, bikes, planes, even boats, whatever you wanted. And as I said, it applies certainly to people, to movies, to music. It is interesting how humans do have this clash within themselves where we always strive for perfection and yet we are surprisingly accepting of things which are the exact opposite of perfect almost like it's the middle ground that gray area that i spoke about that often gets treated the most harshly people who aren't seemingly bright enough to be brilliant but maybe aren't hurt enough to be I don't know, special or something. It's weird. It's the middle ground that gets hurt the most. The average, I guess, like I said with the cars. But overall, that's just my thoughts. As I said, tell me yours down below. And until next time, I'll see you then. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.